Awesome. Thanks for joining us, everybody. What are we all drinking today? I got some, uh, I, I have to confess, the only reason I bought this beer was it had the word gold on it. <laughs> but I got solid gold right here. It's got the shoots black butt porter. It's butte porter, actually. Well, it looks butt to me. <laughs> <laughs> Great Lakes Brewing Company Christmas Ale here. Drinking a red ale from, gosh, I don't remember it, but it's really good. I've got a Woodner Hefeweizen. I'm on Davi Merlot here. I prefer their Cabernet. Fantastic. <laughs> well, you beat all of us in classiness, Lobo. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's been a crazy year, and I'd like to just kind of unpack what's happened in 2020. We're nearing the end of the year. We're nearing Christmas and the holidays. So yeah, let's just take this time to unpack what we've all been through. I'd love to start with Andy. And uh, my brother, Kaiser Johnson, is here. Kaiser, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and then introduce Andy? Uh, sure. Um, I'm Kaiser Johnson. I'm Elijah's brother uh, and uh, Dunnigan's son. And um, uh, yeah, I'm a, a voiceover actor uh, out of Los Angeles. Um, we just recently moved out of Arizona because Los Angeles is crazy. So, uh, and 2020 was really crazy in Los Angeles. So um, that's a little bit about myself. And here's a little bit about Andy Shackman. He's the president and owner of Miles Franklin, a precious metals company that has eclipsed $5 billion in sales. Prior to starting Miles Franklin in 1989, Andy became a licensed financial planner specializing in Swiss franc investments and alternative investments. Fantastic. Well, Andy, what I wanted to ask you today is with all the changes we've seen in 2020, uh, a lot of crazy, crazy things happening, but in particular with gold and silver, what do you think fundamentally has changed this year? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm glad, uh, very thankful that you're all here. And to me, the change in in this industry or in this market has been a constant for the past four years and prior to that i can't think of anything over a dozen plus years that uh, that ever changed it was it seemed to be more of the same and very little changed in the precious metals industry but over the last four years i would characterize this industry as constantly changing it started in 2017 with the central banks in particular, the German Bundesbank requesting their gold to be shipped home from the Bank of England and the New York Fed. Uh, following suit were the Bank of Austria and the Bank of Hungary and the Bank of Poland and the Dutch National Bank, all of the European banks in 2017 requesting their gold to be shipped home. In 2018, the central banks went from net sellers the year before out of the clear blue purchasing more gold than they did in the 60 years previously combined. And that was very unusual in 2018, a complete U-turn. In 2019, of course, we get the reclassification of gold as a tier one asset, which I have long maintained uh, being the most significant event of my 30 year career. And this year I would characterize the difference in this industry being what is happening on the COMEX market. And it's very similar to what we saw in 2017 with the central banks requesting repatriation of their gold this year. It's the subsection group called the others on the COMEX exchange that we classify as sovereign wealth funds, as family offices and very high net worth individuals who seem to be requesting delivery at a massive, massive pace. In fact, every delivery month more so than we typically see in a given year. And this is what is fundamentally different this time or this year. It is the uh, massive accumulation and taking metal off of the exchange and out of harm's way following suit, I believe, to a pattern that we've seen for the last four years. And, and so I think it all follows a string of events uh, that you know have me believing that we haven't seen the end of of uh, you know some very significant moves in the precious metals market. When the most sophisticated traders on the globe start making changes that are fundamentally different like this, uh, to me, I stand up and take notice. So I guess this year, Elijah, for me, the main difference upon everything that we've seen this year would have been the massive amount of gold being pulled off of the COMEX and, and what that means uh, and what that means for prices and 
and, and the market in, in general moving forward. Well, thank you, Andy. We have a question here, Lobo Tigre. Um, and so uh, let me introduce you real quick. Uh, Louis James Lobo Tigre was a legendary sp- Uh, Speculator Doug Casey's protege at Casey Research for almost 14 years until early 2018. He wrote in Casey's flagship newsletter, The International Speculator. Now he runs Louis James LLC, uh, independentspeculator.com, to inform, educate, and enable action for an elite group of savvy investors and those who wish to become such. What I'd like to ask you, Lobo, is essentially, yeah, how has have things fundamentally changed with respect to gold and silver? And I know. He actually recently wrote an article about this, how it's possible that because of all the COVID-19 stimulus that's been pushed through so fast, there's actually also going into 2021, a bearish case for gold. So if you want to lay out for our viewers that (laughs) possibility, but then also the bullish case as well. All right. Well, two for the price of one. Uh, And let me be absolutely clear. I am extremely bullish and to Let's, so let's take the first question there because that makes that case. And I would say, not to, not to contradict my, my esteemed peer here who went first, but we look at things differently. And I don't really see a, a fundamental change. I see what I would call fundamental confirmation. Like we've seen you know, off the charts crazy this year. We thought 2008 was off the charts crazy, but you know, that is peanuts compared to the off the charts crazy we've seen this year. And we have seen gold and silver acting as monetary metals should. I think that's, you could say it's a, it's a big change from previous years and may seem like a big change given how in the doghouse, you know, uh, the, the metals were for so long. Um, but it really is confirmation of something probably almost everybody in the audience would agree with me about, you know, the nature of monetary metals and how they should behave in a monetary crisis or in a situation where, you, know, you have off the charts crazy things being done with monetary and fiscal policy. So I see 2020 not really as changing anything fundamentally, but as really, you know, being almost like a, you know, a Hosanna call from above for a fundamentalist like me saying, you were right. I mean, look at what's happened. Look at the response to monetary policy. This really tells you that these are monetary metals. You know, some people sneer, you know, you must be an Austrian if you think about them as monetary metals. They're just commodities like pork bellies or or coffee beans. I I disagree. I think 2020 has really put paid to any notion that, you know, gold and silver are just like coffee or any other commodity. I mean, yes, they are commodities, but they're also monetary metals. And we saw that this year. So I'm extremely bullish. The, the, the money printing, <laughs> I think, you know, just what's been done already justifies much higher gold and silver prices. And I think we're going to see a lot more ahead. Uh, but to quickly bring in the case that you mentioned, I, I also don't want to be so bullish that, you know, I close my eyes. I believe what I believe. And I'm not going to pay any attention to any data that comes my way that contradicts my, my cherished theory. So I try to look around, well, how might I be wrong? What could change things? And one thought that has occurred to me was, COVID-19 did not cause gold and silver to go as high as they did this year. They were already on an uptrend that, you know, they had bottomed in late 2015, and they had really started a more significant uptrend, you know, upwards after the Powell pivot. Again, monetary policy for monetary metals, that's significant. So late 2018 is what started the most recent sort of hockey stick part of this move. And that was continuing. And that I think would have us almost where we are now in gold and silver prices, even without COVID-19 this year. Um, but COVID-19 did happen, you know, right? And, and Congress did send people a bunch of money that would not have been sent this year if not for COVID-19. The Fed was already lowering rates, but hit, you know, hit the, the panic in March and they just fell off a cliff, right? They just went straight to zero, no lowering, no measured reduction, just boom, we're down to zero. Um, that probably wouldn't have happened without COVID-19. It would have taken more time. So the bear case thesis is that some of what was going to be happening over the years ahead was pulled forward into 2020. And, you know, every year is not going to be a 2020. I don't, I, I don't know that we can expect the same kind of extravagance. Uh, and, you know, where does the Fed go from here? You know, as, you know they don't want to go negative. They're resisting that. Congress can hand out more money, but it's it's difficult for the Fed to go more negative than they had without really risking systemic uh, instability. So the bear case is 
that maybe some of the bullishness over the next few years for gold and silver has been pulled forward into 2020, and that could turn into a headwind next year. I'm not predicting this. I'm not saying that's what will happen. I'm saying that's something I want to watch out for. Thank you, Lobo. Um, now we're going to uh, head over to Chris Marcus. Um, Chris Marcus is a former equity options trader on the American and New York stock exchanges. He's a financial writer for Miles Franklin and founder of Arcadia Economics. With everything happening in 2020, Chris, we've seen you know precious metals take off quite a bit, um, and silver we saw you know double from March and even more than that. But you've kept making the case that really that silver is so undervalued because it's not even at 50% its all-time high. What is your take on where silver has been in 2020 and where do you see it heading next year? Well, I think this is perhaps the best example yet of people being able to see that what is actually happening in supply and demand for silver does not match this price we see posted on this fantastical thing called the COMEX. Um and I guess maybe a great way of pointing that out, Andy was on my show a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him over the past week how many people have been buying versus selling. Uh, Andy, I think you said there were 231 orders and four were sells, and this was the same week where you see the price of silver drop a dollar on Monday morning on no news that anyone on planet Earth that I've been able to find as, is able to identify. So... I would say 2020 maybe perhaps pointed out more and more to people how this is priced, what's going on, and perhaps also that you can understand what's happening. You don't have to get riled up about it. I mean, if you have a business or a paycheck and you're making income and someone's putting something on sale, then you know that's good news if you can see it that way. I also get it that people see some insane things happening in the world and want the price to go up. And I think in due time, it will. Perhaps one thing that people can take away from the move is that we had silver sit under $20 for four years. And then in the span of four weeks, it went up from 18 to 29. Now, yes, you had COVID. Yes, you had mines shut down. Yes, you had a surge in demand, all of which support a rise in the price of silver. Although, those things were happening months before the price actually went up. So while as a student of markets, I love the idea that prices move on news and, and things are funded, uh, factored in real time, this efficient market hypothesis sounds great. Um, but at least from what I can see, silver is not going to work like that yet. At the end of the day, you could forget everything that's already happened. If there's one takeaway, I think the Fed has made clear they're going to force the price higher. Maybe it'll be 2021. Maybe it'll be tomorrow. Maybe it'll be five years from now. I don't know the answer to that. But I mean, like, what would happen if the stock market was down 2% tomorrow? Or if something happened overnight? You'd have Jerome Powell in his pajamas running to the printing press. So I just don't see. And then not only don't I see, I've not been able to find anyone. And I'm not just bringing people on my show to agree with me. I can't find anyone on the planet who can explain how the Fed will ever be able to undo the printed money that it's done. You got a taste of that at the end of 2018. Um, I would say with mm -hmm. silver and gold, don't expect it to happen linearly yet. For the same reason some people saw the housing crisis in advance, I think this is easy to spot and... Um, you know, and it's nice to be here with everyone tonight because everyone is seeing it in their own way and sharing it. And I get it. Some people don't want to care until it happens. But, you know, that's the nature of markets. You say it before it happens and then see where it's headed. So thanks, Chris. Question for uh, for David. Uh, David Smith is senior analyst for the Morgan Report and a regular contributor to MoneyMetals.com. For the past 15 years, he has investigated precious metals mines and exploration sites in Argentina, Chile, Mexico, Bolivia, China, Canada, and U.S. Now, David, I'd love to ask you about, yeah, the mines, the silver mines and COVID-19. We saw some shutdowns. How did this pandemic impact the silver supply? And where do you see the silver supply being impacted in the future in 2021? We were already going into the fourth year of uh, nominal decline in silver production worldwide uh, with continuing decreasing head grades. 
And as Andy and uh, Chris and others have really artfully pointed out in Dunnigan, uh, it seems like often when the price drops, the, the, the buying increases. And when the price rises, the buying increases. And uh, I just feel that we're on a knife edge, uh, which is not fully appreciated by mark, the market itself and the, the participants, uh, that we could have something kind of coming out of nowhere that when we look back on it and we go, how did that trigger? Well, it was just that little extra leaf that kind of pushed things over the edge and we could see silver start ramping up uh, like it went from 18 to $29 through resistance that was supposed to keep it in check for six or eight months. And this next one could take it up to 40, uh, you know, and that's really going to release a firestorm of people wanting to be involved or thinking, I better get going here before this last train leaves me. And I think, uh, you know, I, I also think that market participants want to find a story that they can really latch onto and participate in. And there are several gold plays and a couple of silver plays that are uh, on the way toward production or toward a discovery of a much larger resource than the market can, you know, sees right now. And any one of those could become a special case, which suddenly sees three, four hundred percent, you know, movement in the share price, and with the concomitant purchase of more metal. So uh, I, I think it's it's the old story of uh, things are quiet out there, but maybe a little too quiet. So I don't I don't think we do ourselves a big favor by not paying attention. So we need to be ready to act decisively if we've not added everything we wanted. And if we see something that looks really sharp to go ahead and, and try to pick some of that up. So I, I'm very optimistic. And I think before the end of the year, we could see some fireworks that will really carry into January, February. And I'm pretty excited about it. Thanks, David. Uh, next up, we have Bill Holter. Bill Holter writes and is partnered with Jim Sinclair at the newly formed Holter Sinclair Collaboration. Prior, he wrote for Miles Franklin from 2012 to 2015. Bill worked as a retail stockbroker for 23 years, including 12 as a branch manager at AG Edwards. He left Wall Street in late 2006 to avoid potential liabilities related to the management of paper assets. Awesome. Well, Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, yeah, what I'd love to ask you about today is the economy. I'd love to transition to the economy because in 2020, we saw you know an economic crash because of the pandemic. And one of the things a lot of people are talking about is that, oh, once we have this vaccine, we're going to get back to normal. Now, <laughs> you've asked the question, were we really in a normal spot before the pandemic hit us? So can you address that? Yeah, we certainly were not in a normal spot. Um, if you look back to September 16th of 2019, that's when the repo market broke. Uh, interest rates overnight went to 10% and the Fed was had was forced to pump 50, 75, 100 billion each and every night into the system to keep that from, from unraveling. Um, oddly, the shutdowns with COVID were, if you want to call them convenient, because that created a, a massively uh, lesser demand for credit. So that eased, uh, it eased the repo stress. It also gave the Fed cover to basically spew trillions and trillions into the system, and uh, along with other central banks all over the world. Uh, as far as normal is concerned, you can, I, I wrote, oh, I don't know, three or four separate articles and spaced them about 30 days, 60 days apart. And I would title each one, we're only 90 days late. We're only 150 days late, et cetera. And here comes January 1st, and guess what happens? All of these moratoriums on uh, foreclosures, on evictions, et cetera, they all run out. So January 1st, you're going to start you're going to start to see some reality because landlords, uh, creditors, et cetera, are going to be able to begin to evict, foreclose, et cetera. 
it's almost like, uh, you know, you saw food lines back in the 1930s. You don't see food lines today because of the EBT cards. It, what I'm getting at is everything has been uh, masqueraded. Everything's been, been hidden. And what comes, what comes now is reality. And the reality is you've got central banks and sovereigns now at 99.7% debt to GDP. That's not the whole system. That's just the central banks and sovereigns. And you go back 20 years ago, and any country that had a total debt of 100% to GDP was entering Banana Republic. The world is now 267% debt to GDP. The world is a Banana Republic. So what I'm getting at is what we have coming is a credit event. And of course, because all currencies are credit based, it's going to be a massive monetary event. And gold and silver are the only monetary assets assets that cannot, they don't have any liability. They can't bankrupt. So while you're, you look uh, back and, and thought that it was normal, no, it wasn't normal. The central banks had to prop the system up ever since 2008, and here's your crescendo. Here's your crescendo. I think that's a really good point. And you, you mentioned all the expanded debt and the all the money printing that's been going on. And yeah, I'd love uh, if my father, Dunnigan, can address this. But first, Kaiser, let's uh, introduce Dunnigan here. Let's introduce that, that guy. Um, Dunnigan Kaiser has hosted the Liberty and Finance slash Reluctant Preppers channels since 2013, where he brings together leading experts from the fields of precious metals, mining, finance, constitutional liberty, and preparedness to benefit a growing audience of over 45,000 passionate subscribers, eight and a half million views from passionate subscribers. Now, Dunnigan, yeah, can you address this question about all the more money printing we've seen in 2020 and debt creation? It's historic. And what kind of an impact? Why does this even matter? Yeah, well, I'm certainly no expert on this, but I like to bring experts on my channel of uh, liberty and finance. That's what I've been doing all along since 2013 is bringing on the experts. So I can just ask the questions on the part of our audience because we're all in that same position of needing to understand what's going on. Why does this feel wrong in our gut and what in the official numbers that can be available and the unofficial numbers we're not being told can really help us to, to shine some light on this. So the first thing I was going to share is this chart. Uh, several of these charts are right from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. Uh, they have a website called Fred where you can get uh, printouts. And this is the public facing uh, expose of some of the total public debt, some of the money supply, the M1 money supply and uh, so on. And this first one, this first chart goes back to 1965 and it shows both the U.S. federal debt at, that's acknowledged in, in the primary debt as well as the M1 money supply. And you see what everyone's been describing as this hockey stick increase just in the last year. If you go back and look at the 2008 to 2010 period where, you know, the great the global financial collapse, the GFC, as people affectionately call it, or the great the previous um, recession that we went through, you can see a marked increase during that period of time, but it looks like a, a bump in the road compared to what's happening right now. And that's one of the things that, that occurred to me when uh, Lobo, when you were talking about, as we've seen often in, in credit cycles, that's one of the, the difficulties that is posed by the, by the exuberance or the last phase of a credit cycle expansion is you, is you pull, when you go to these artificially low interest rates, you pull activity forward from future quarters and even future years into the current year so that everything it masks what's actually going on. You don't realize when people say, oh, I'll look at this rise in activity, they think that's a good sign of a healthy economy, but actually it, it's the sign of a cliff that you're about to, to go over and it, it can cause uh, that, that big gap to that, that empty air underneath a pocket of air underneath future activity. But there's a different way of looking at it, which is the exponential growth function, which from my engineering background is something I'm quite familiar with. And that is that when you're on an exponential growth curve, if that's the underlying fundamental of the system, which does match the, the fundamentals of a fiat uh, currency system, then you can't necessarily expect to get relief uh, from that runaway phase. In fact, you can't assume that just because this 
the year has been uh, going up faster than ever before that you're going to get relief next year if the underlying mathematics are that of exponential um, uh, exponential growth. We have a tweet I'd like to share as well from Sven Henrik, also known as the Northman Trader, who says M1 money supply has increased yet another $210 billion the week between November 23rd and November 30th, on top of the $500 billion in the prior week. That's over $700 billion in, the, in two weeks. $700 billion in two weeks. So the typical uh, growth in the U.S. deficit, you know, the, the deficit year to year was usually under a trillion in, in recent decades. And so here you had $700 billion in two weeks. It says the M1 money supply of the United States has increased by 64.5% since the beginning of 2020. There is no history for this, none. And in the third uh, screen I'd like to share uh, with you all, uh, there's a picture of shows over the last, since the GFC, with QE1, QE2, Operation Twist, QE3, global $5 trillion plus in, in, uh, uh, in Fed pausing there, but then the Fed caves in. As uh, Chris had mentioned, they tried to take a break <laughs> and so-called normalize their balance sheet, but weren't able to because the market immediately swooned. So they went into not QE, and now we're in this QE to infinity and the latest box is around this called mad monetary policy where it's truly appears to be going vertical. So why should this matter? We've had both Rob Kirby and Alistair McLeod on our channel talking about when you hit that vertical section of the exponential growth curve that the strains on so many aspects of the banking industry and the derivative complex get to be where you simply can't stop. You've really painted yourself into a corner and you can't stop doing that. So if that's the case, uh, as Alistair maintains, then, and I, uh, several of the guests have mentioned this as well tonight, is that since all of the world's currencies are now fiat currencies, and those are all debt-based, that when you have a runaway in the debt markets and in the bond markets, you're going to get a potential strain and perhaps a fatal strain in the currencies. And people are not used to thinking about this. When you talk to people about what are the financial risks that their family is facing, they're talking, they think about, well, I don't wanna be in risky stocks or I wanna be in, in these or that, this company might get disrupted or whatever. But if the very currency itself of every country in the world is on this uh, collision course with mathematics, uh, we really seem to be potentially entering this runaway phase. We certainly are seeing unprecedented in the history of our country, well, not only gross numbers, but percentage-wise numbers increase in both the debt and in the money supply. So that's where I'm trying to sound the alarm system to people who are thinking they'll wait for, for some sign to be really announced that there's trouble in the banking system or trouble in the currency supply. And that's where Chris Marcus said, you don't have to wait for the official announcement. In fact, we've had Brad Harris on from Full Spectrum Survival saying, if you, the official warning will always come too late. So trying to help people be aware and prepared. Well, thanks, Dunnigan. Thanks, Dad. Um, and uh, next, uh, Andy, a uh, question for you on on all of, of uh, you know, what Dunnigan's talking about, what all of the rest of the guests are talking about here is, um, can you outline for us like, what has changed fundamentally for the economy in uh, 2020? Well, yeah, like, like Dunnigan and Chris said before him, first of all, the, the Fed will never be able to normalize its balance sheet. Richard Russell always said, inflate or die. They've reached a, a period of time where they've kind of put themselves, stumbled in, rather into a trap. And that trap, when you look at the economy, which has, has really been uh, in, many, in many levels destroyed, uh, you have a Federal Reserve that continues to require more interventions and stimulus to sustain lower rates of economic growth. And that, to me, is really one of the big differences is now the acceptance uh, of, of stimulus as being the, the white knight to come in and save the economy. And uh, markets react to whether or not we get stimulus. And I think another big fundamental change is the, the separation between uh, the economy at large or Main Street and, and Wall Street. And, you know, they say that um, corporate profits are the best indicator of, of economic growth or economic strength. But, you know, in reality, other than a handful of really very large companies, I would argue corporate profits are really probably pretty bad this year. And uh, so I think 
to me, the, the real big fundamental changes on top of everything that we've seen, um, you know, 26 or 7 percent of every dollar in circulation being uh, put into circulation this year alone, uh, the massive money printing and, and the destruction of the economy through the shutdowns, to me, the real big differences uh, are, number one, the trap that the Fed has put themselves in where they will continue, have to continue to to uh, print money and, and to uh, stimulate the economy. And, and, and two, the major separation, the dichotomy between Wall Street and Main Street and, and how it seems to be the tail wagging the dog. Uh, where I come from, I always thought that the stock market was supposed to be a reflection of the economy, uh, not the other way around. So uh, I think to me, those are the two big differences, a, an economy that's detached from Wall Street or vice versa, and a Federal Reserve that has painted themselves into a corner where the minute they stop blowing air into the balloon that has a gaping hole in it, it all comes crashing down. And these are a precarious times that I think we have found ourselves in. And quite frankly, as Chris said, and as Dunnigan said, I don't see how the Fed can ever stop. It's inflate or die. I think it's the mantra they will have to adopt. Andy, did you say that 26% of, of every dollar has just been added to the economy this year, That's essentially? Correct. That is correct. That is correct. Massive <laughs> money. And I always like to say, you know, a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. And they've added over $4 trillion to, to the deficit this year. These are numbers that, that have no precedent, that, that, that have no way, you know, for us to to measure against in terms of historical precedent. And so I think we're, we're deeply adrift in uncharted seas where I think we've full, yet to fully understand the implications. Um, and I think we'll see that moving forward. I'd love to pass this off to Bill because I know you were talking about the economy and if you could address what Andy is talking about, how yeah, there's been so much money printing this year I mean, what kind of impact do you see that having? Do you see us going into high inflation? I mean, some people are talking about how we're going to see essentially like we, what we saw in the 70s and 80s, like really high inflation. What is your take? Uh, I assure you the 70s and 80s never saw 26% inflation. And that's basically what Andy's saying is that they've inflated the money supply by 26% in one year. Uh, in the old days, when, when reality was around, the real economy would generate cash flow. And companies were able to, to take debt on and they could service that debt from the cash flow. And what's happened here is because the world has basically shut down, the, the, the cash flow has definitely lessened I mean, the, the cash flow, the corporate earnings are, are much, much lower than they were last year. I think they got as low as, uh, what, 2014 or 15, something like that. So it was a huge hit. And you got to understand that cash flow is used to pay debt service. And now the debt service interest rates have come down uh, year after year. So the debt service has been has been smaller. I, I shouldn't say smaller. The, the the interest rate is lower, but because they keep piling more and more debt on, the debt service doesn't shrink. And the real economy shrinking has really stressed uh, the ability to pay on the debt. And remember, one man's asset is another man's liability. And that's important to understand that when one person can't pay, the other end is not getting paid. So what it's doing is it's making the debt, the, the gross debt that has just exploded over the last, well, really over the last 20 years, but uh, since 2008, that exploded debt now is in a much, much more precarious position because the real economy can't service it anymore. So what happened? You had central banks stepping in to, to pump uh, money supply into the system so that the debt could be serviced. But what happened with that? You've got central banks, like I mentioned, you've got central banks and sovereigns who have basically destroyed their, their balance sheets. And they are the ones who issue the currency. 
I personally believe we're going to see uh, deflation of assets and inflation of goods. The deflation of assets will be caused by debt imploding and the inflation of things we need, you know, daily items will be caused by the, the crashing of, of purchasing power of the currencies. So it's a double whammy. You know, what you own becomes worth less and what you need becomes worth or, or costs you more. Now, I'd love to turn it over to Lobo because I know you've talked about uh, things like that. And you've also talked about recently in an article how it'll look like there's a little bit of a rebound in the economy, but that will be deceiving. Could you expand on that? Sure. Like, so <laughs> we're going back to the bear case. And, yeah, sure, why not? Everybody's so bullish here. I'll anoint myself a temporary <laughs> pseudo bear just so we can have some fun here. Um, I, I agree with everything everybody has said. There isn't it's been a single thing any of these gentlemen have said that I thought was wrong, incorrect, exaggerated, foolish, silly, whatever. But I got to say, <laughs> I remember being just as persuaded in 2008, 2009. And at that time, we didn't have the madness of 2020. At that time, everything that had been done in the wake of 2008 was off the charts crazy. And the kinds of things that I'm hearing on this call is exactly the same kind of arguments I was hearing back then. Wow, we tripled the money supply. I forget which M it was, but by the time 2010 had rolled around, I think we had tripled the money supply. And, and it just made perfect sense that gold would just keep zooming. Right? The, the reality was, the fundamental was, the trend was, and then boom, we hit the brakes in late 2011. And, and, and okay, even in 2011, I thought, okay, it's gone a little too far, a little too fast. We should get some correction here. But I didn't think that we'd get a five-year bear after all those bullish fundamentals. So I just want to say, <laughs> I am a bull. Uh, but I've been a mistaken bull before, and I think it, it, uh, it's important to not be so convinced by your own logic and your own reasoning that you stop looking at what's happening around you. And so uh, prices and markets are often driven not by reason, not by the facts, not by fundamentals, but by sentiment and by just craziness piling on craziness. So just imagine, I'm not saying this will happen, but just imagine that a lot of the lockdowns, shutdowns, and everything that terrible that's happened this year has all kinds of people putting off purchases and vacations and all kinds of things they're not doing because they're afraid or because they can't, maybe some because they're broke, or maybe not. Uh, I've got a son who's making so much money, more money now on unemployment than he was in an entry-level job <laughs> before COVID-19. He's doing better. He doesn't need any help. He's, he's got a windfall. <laughs> it's just amazing to me. You know, that's, that's the economy we're in. So, but imagine 2021. Woohoo. You know, vaccine 27 is even better than vaccine 26. COVID's dead. The witch is dead. It's party time. Okay, we're going to Hawaii. Okay, we're taking trips. Okay, we're buying more houses. We're buying another car. We're doing all this stuff that we put off for all of 2020. So you could not only have the pulling forward of stimulus and monetary policy I was talking about before, you could have this appearance of a booming economy from really just a few quarters of non-irrational uh, exa exuberance being pushed off into the future, into 2021. And so then imagine you're the policymakers. And look, woohoo, as travel is back, airlines are back, they don't need any more bailouts, oh look, the auto industry is just booming. It's great. Oh, look, housing is great. All these people moving out of the cities, buying houses. And oh, look at this. People are spending. They're buying flats. Oh, look at this. The movie theaters are full again. Everybody's happy, happy, joy, joy again. So imagine this, this big boom in mid-2020. Spring arrives. COVID's dead. Woohoo! hoo um, I could imagine the policymakers saying, ah, we fixed it. Our job's done. You know, maybe we could start raising rates. Or we could think about thinking about raising rates. You know, what a drastic change that would be. And the policymakers in Congress, oh, well, we don't need any more fiscal stimulus. Ah, the airlines are fine now. Everybody's flying again. So there's your bear case. You know, that wouldn't be reality. I'm not disagreeing with anything anybody said. I'm saying the sort of suppressed demand has a spring effect, and it creates this illusion of prosperity. And not just Oh, oh, we've got a recovery, but oh, it's better than ever, right? And just this massive illusion of prosperity 
So you put the brakes on all the on the fiscal and monetary policy, and monetary metals could respond negatively to that. I mean, I, I mean, come on, we've seen this just in the last couple of weeks. Congress says, "Oh ho, last ditch, we're going to put together this emergency patch, nine hundred billion more. Gold and silver go up." And then Congress says, "Oh wait a minute, we don't agree. Gold and silver goes down." Okay, so <laughs> it shouldn't be this way, but our reality right now is that all this nonsense about stimulus, we're talking about how stimulus has replaced the real economy. You know, so right now that matters more than it should. And if next summer, everybody's all hunky-dory and we don't need no more stimulus, we don't need no more zero interest rates, that would be a headwind for gold and silver. Again, not predicting this, but I'm not wanting to go into the future blind. Gentlemen, have at it. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to comment on that if I may. Sure, Chris. Uh, I agree with everything you said there. I think it's well put. And I suppose it also de depends on what someone is targeting. So, I mean, to the degree that you could say, all right, well, you know, while we were waiting for gold for nine years, you could have done other things, made other income. And I don't know, certainly to the degree if someone wants to go trade short term on Wall Street and, and or do something like that. Yeah, there's, there's a variety of other things. With that said, from 2008... I guess that was when gold went from a thousand down to seven hundred. If we had taken a long nap in between, then here it is. Despite all of the things that have happened, still, and that's why, to me, you know, having the experience of trading short term on Wall Street, I remember thinking, well, this seems a little silly when you can see something that, if you can take that step back and give yourself the long term perspective. Uh, I mean, I think not only do you have a high, ch uh, is there a, a high rate of return possible, but you're in the rare situation where, at least in my mind, on a long enough horizon, there's a high probability of achieving that high rate of return over the longer term. I mean, I'm surprised that we're sitting here today with gold, you know, it's crossed above 2000 and silver still as low as it is. Yet, I guess it depends what people are wanting. If, if, if somebody wants a return over the next year, a guaranteed return, I probably wouldn't say go to silver because you can't guarantee, you accept it is what it is. Although when you look at the conditions, to me, it's very similar to what happened leading up to the housing bubble. It's kind of like, like when the Warner engine light goes on. Some people say, all right, well, I'll just hope it goes away. The guy who knows how to look at the engine looks there and sees, okay, there's something here that if it's not addressed, you have a very clear end result, which... You know, for the folks who saw that with the housing bubble, they were right. It probably took longer. And someone was mentioning to me the other day, uh, maybe the metals will end up taking longer than anybody here thinks or could imagine. And I allow for that possibility. Um, but when I look at all the things that have happened and all, all the different data points that are out there now, if you tell me it goes on another 10 or 20 years, I think that's hard to pull off, but I could believe that more than that everyone that I've spoken to and that's on this call and in the silver and gold community is flat out wrong. And that Dick Cheney's right. Deficits <laughs> don't matter. No, no. Bush knows how to run an economy. And okay. uh, let, let me jump in there, Chris, because you've said something really important. And that is when I'm, when I articulated this case, I was wearing, I have several hats. One is as a private investor uh, and one is as an evil scum of the earth newsletter writer. And being an honorary evil scum of the earth newsletter writer, I have to worry about how people will react if markets go up or down in the near term. Now, personally, I don't, I don't sweat the daily fluctuations at all, and I'm not really a short-term investor. Um, and certainly in terms of gold and silver themselves, the metals, I basically never sell those unless I have to. <laughs> so if this thing happens next summer, what does that mean? Does that mean, oh, it's a disaster? It means, hey, great, it's on sale, I'm buying more. So, um, and I'd like to hear more from Andy on this, actually. I'd turn it over to Andy. But I just, I just want to say this time frame thing is really, really crucial, right? Yeah. And if you're looking for, you know, hockey stick gains within, you know, the next year or so, which is what the typical newsletter writer wants, which it's how I imagine most of my clients, you know, want me to guide them. And if I say, hey, here's an investment, I have no idea when it's going to work out, but in the next five years, I think sometime it's going to be great. I think I'll be able to count my readers on one hand and have fingers left over. 
Uh, whereas if I say, okay, I think this has a good chance of doubling over the next year, people are like, sign me up. I want to know more. So time frame is crucial. And, and we're talking about big issues here. And on the big issues, I think there basically is no bear case. There's so much money printing has been done, is being done, will be done. We're all on the same page. But wearing my evil scum of the earth newsletter writer hat, I have to say, you know, it would be horrifically, um, I, I would feel bad if I told uh, clients and prospective clients, hey, jump into gold now, it's going to be great. And then it goes down 30% like it did in 2008. I, you know, that would be unhappy outcomes. Um, so actually, th this ties into Andy and for me, Andy, you're over there. So I'm looking at you, Andy, and say, you know, can you tell us more about the actual real world demand you're seeing from people who are actually buying the stuff and not just pushing paper around in New York? I'm, I'm really interested in what your experience is, you know, post 2000 peak. Sure. So, you know, 2008 was one of the most interesting experiences I've ever had in this industry. It shaped my my thought um, in many ways. You had gold go from 1,000 to 700 in a period of a week to 10 days and, and silver go from 21 to 9. Now, you don't have to be economists to understand that if something that you bought, investment A and investment B, falls by 65 and 30 percent respectively, that there's probably not much of any demand for that for those two items. And, you know, page one of, of any economics book, freshman level economics, freshman high school economics book, page one is going to be the law of supply and demand. And if you see something falling in price precipitously, you would suspect there's, there's no demand for it. And, and in fact, probably an overabundance of supply as people are selling. It was a very interesting time, in fact, when that happened, within a week to 10 days of that happening, July, late July 08, every single mine or mint rather across the globe was shut down. The US mint was shut down eight times in 08. The Canadian and the uh, Australian or the Austrian mint, excuse me, were working eight, three eight hour shifts a day, 24 hours a day, and were 12 to 18 weeks back ordered. The Perth mint in Australia shut down uh, that August took no new business the rest of the year and the Rand Mint in South Africa ran out of, of product for the first time in their nearly 60 year history. And so what was very interesting is that I was getting phone calls from dealers all around the globe, including across Europe. Fellows in, uh, in Ireland would call me and say, we can't get any product in our normal supply channels in, in Switzerland and in Germany. Every major dealer across the United States was sold out of product. Uh, we were at the time were a U.S. Mint, still are a U.S. Mint authorized reseller, one of only 27 in the world. And so we had a direct line to the U.S. Mint where we were told we couldn't place any orders. Now, this is as the price was in free fall. Uh, and if it weren't for David Smith's partner, David Morgan, the entire industry in the United States would have had nothing to sell, nothing to sell the whole second half of 08. I got a phone call from David Morgan uh, who said to me, hey, Andy, I know some fellows uh, in here up here in upstate Washington, a company called Pyromet, and they have been in um, the medical device industry for the last 20, 30 years, and they have a boatload of silver that they've uh, taken from x-ray machines that they have in scrap, and they want to fill a void. And so they started making the ugliest 100-ounce bars you've ever seen. They just said 100 ounces. They didn't say AG or anything. No, 100 ounces of what? But I will tell you that every dealer in the country, that's all they sold for a few months. And now think about this for a moment. As the prices are falling precipitously, 65% and 35%, you would think that that means supply is just being dumped all over the place. But in reality, every single mint refiner dealer was out of product. There was nothing you could buy. And I honestly believed we were going out of business. And it was at that point that I realized that this was a paper driven phenomenon, a drive by shooting, a massive drive by shooting of the COMEX market. And of course, we all know what happened over the next three years. It rallied on its way back up. But I will tell you this, whenever we see these big drops in the price of gold and silver over the last several years, with the exception of 2017, which I'll talk about in a moment, but every other single time, it is completely detached from what's happening in the industry. No one's selling. Nobody's selling as the price is being driven down. In 2017, it was a little bit different. I wanted to hide under my desk or really not even come to the office because in 17, when the price was falling, it came in conjunction with Bitcoin going to the moon. 
And everyone thought at the same time that, that Bitcoin and gold were cut from the same cloth. And you know, how could this be? And uh, how could it be that, 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 that this decentralized uh, new deal that is like gold 2.0, as some people are calling it now, would go up and gold would go down? And, and quite frankly, it was a dark time in the precious metals industry. But, but here again, uh, I will tell you, with the exception of 2017, um, the last several years, every single time we see a price drop, and in 2008 especially, whenever we see a price drop, it is in conjunction with increased demand on physical. And it's, it's, be, it's because people listen to you, Lobo, and to Chris, and to Dunnigan, and to Bill, and to David, and David. And people are beginning to realize that there is manipulation, that the only way to successfully accumulate market, if you a uh, uh, product rather, if you believe it's in a bull market, is to buy the dips and to not chase the rallies, and that's what we're seeing right now. But in general, well, well, the the main difference above all else uh, from what we would think would be the outcome of a falling price is that it's detached from reality in terms of physical selling. Nobody sells anything these days, and so. Uh, I would argue that it's uh, it's 100% a paper-driven phenomenon, and that is uh, has very little of anything to do with physical demand. And and you can listen to some of the people that that Chris has had on his show recently, uh, Andrew McGuire, namely, who who says you know you can't find thousand ounce bars, you can't find kilo bars. I've heard, and uh, so the big industrial size bars. Um, are becoming harder and harder and harder to get as the price has, has really kind of languished. Now, languish is kind of an interesting thought when you look at, at gold and silver, which have both done very well this year based upon all traditional measurements um, and continue to, to do well, but they're not moonshotting the way a lot of people thought that they would. And, uh, and any time we see uh, a, a price pullback along with narrative that would support the end of the bull market, uh, it has very little, if anything, to do with people who understand what's going on. You know, maybe what it does is it keeps other people from jumping into the gold market, selling dollars, uh, and, and buying precious metals. But in in terms of people that we talk to every day, it has very little, if any, any bearing in terms of demand. And uh, quite frankly, I would argue our business is stronger when the price falls. So um, interesting in that it works that way. But it has, other than 2017, as long back as I can remember. Well, you know, in supportive to what Andy is saying, uh, I don't see any let up in the demand in the Shanghai Gold Exchange and Silver Exchange. They continue to add every week. And, uh, you know, India continues to add uh, to buy more silver. Um, I've seen figures that 75% of the available above ground silver has been spoken for by ETFs, which have, you know, had record builds over the last couple of years. And it wouldn't take very much to create a situation like having Bitcoin where that 25% disappears all of a sudden or gets down to the point where it's 5 or 10%. And so there's so many outliers there uh, with the continued uh, dysregulation going on by COVID, which there's talk now that they're shutting down uh, big chunks of, of the UK and, and Germany again. Uh, you know, they, they're using a blunt instrument to deal with all this stuff. Uh, and I also think, you know, uh, what Bill had said earlier about the, the increase in the money supply, what happens if we get a spike in velocity, which is what really takes the turnover of money? That's what it takes to create inflation beyond the increase in the money supply. And I think that could happen as necessity, not just because, you know, buying food that's become more scarce and more expensive, uh, buying, uh, you know, building materials and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so you have that, an inflation spike due to that. There's so many unknowns out there, any one of which could tip the apple cart over that I think it behooves people uh, to be aware of the, of the different alternative scenarios that Lobo and others have mentioned, but not to get to the point where they, they uh, are so concerned about what might happen, which one of those four or five could happen, that they don't do anything. And, and, and I think it's a wise course to con continue to acquire the metal and the quality miners when you see prices go into an area that you feel is justified based upon your planning and, and the due diligence that you've done, rather than waiting for some magic moment 
when it becomes clear that, oh, yes, I should react. And we're getting more questions about should I wait until the chart has three closes above 1850 on gold? And should I wait until the tax selling season is done in December? And meanwhile, you're seeing some of these miners up 30 to 70 percent in the last four or five weeks due to their own metrics. The heck with the selling of the tax season or waiting for the chart to give us the answers because Mr. Market gives us the reasons later. Or look what's happened to uranium, you know, for, for it's been on fire here the last week or so. So all of these elements and even now some of the base metals, they share a certain signature for different reasons. But in terms of a concept, there, there's not a lot of them around to, to make up for uh, a big uh, pro problem being addressed effectively by the market without some uh, disruption in the price, often to the upside, whether it's copper, silver, gold, uranium, nickel, more and more of those metals are falling in line with, and, and, and of course, if you listen to Robert Friedland lately, you know, with his take on copper, I mean, this, the EV revolution is not going to get sidetracked no matter what. And whether it's a good thing or not, or whether it's going to be greener for everybody, it's going to demand massive amounts of metals. And to think that, that uh, the base metals are five years out before they start a run after gold and silver, I think is, is going to leave some people behind because copper is already knocking, as you know, at multiple year highs. So there's enough unknowns out there that I think it behooves people to try to have a regular acquisition program based upon their goals, the money they have to commit and whatnot, so that they are well positioned not over position, but also not standing there waiting for some magic moment to do something. And that's a really good point, David. Um, yeah, kind of pointing out that there are so many unknowns right now that just kind of maybe dipping your toe in right now would be a good idea. But obviously everyone has to do their own research, but I'd love to end with Dunnigan here because that's something you've pointed out so often that it's, it's better to be many, many years too early than just a couple seconds too late. The only thing that comes to mind about that is that the strangeness of human psychology, I know Andy's talked about it, we've had others on talking about it, but there's this narrative driven psychology. Rick Rules talked about that. I think uh, Lobos mentioned that. There's this idea that people are wanting to know, based on what happened yesterday, I can predict what's gonna to happen tomorrow and so if I wanna be on that. But that idea that you have to that uh, you have to be in position because by the time it becomes obvious that movement is going to happen or is happening or already has happened, then you don't get to go back and restart and, and get the train back into the station so you can get on it again. So by the time it becomes obvious that it was a good idea, it's no longer as good of an idea as it was back when it seemed like it was a bad idea. So that's what we try to remind people. You've talked about that for years, Elijah, as normalcy bias, that we are all, uh, uh, subject to that fallacy that is, I, it's always been this way. I'm accustomed to things being more or less this way. Therefore, I expect tomorrow and the day after and the day after to be that way. And when you have these unprecedented things occurring, it's it's very, we're all reluctant to accept the fact that these are in fact uh, very different departures from what happened yesterday or last year or a decade before. And to accommodate ourselves to the fact that if we want to just be ready in some way for that potential eventuality. We've got to make those preparedness times. In other words, you've always got to be like Noah before the flood. You've always got to be out of step with your peers uh, to make those pre uh, preparations and to make sure that you're ready just in case, have a plan B, have an insurance. Bill, were you trying to uh, chime in on that? I was just gonna say uh, the time to prepare is when you have the capital to prepare. In other words, the time to buy gold and silver is when you have the capital to, to buy it. Uh, gold and silver, you shouldn't think of them as a speculation. You should think of them as savings. And knowing what we know with the situation as far as debt has gone exponential, debt cannot, debt cannot be paid back. It can either be inflated away or uh, liquidated, one or the other. There's no way that the, the real economies are going to be able to pay the debt back. So if you know what the ending is, you're saving for the ending. You're not speculating for the ending. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, yeah, I guess to end, 
how was everyone's drink? I know uh, mine was definitely uh, golden, right? It was it was quite good. Wow. It was a very mild beer, but I loved it. So, cheers, cheers, cheers to you all. Thank yeah. you for coming on. And and I'd like to just to end one last point, and I think Bill Bill said it best. And you know, gold is not an investment, and people looking to get rich should look elsewhere and look to mining shares or look to cryptocurrencies or, or look to other things. Precious metals has been wealth for over 5,000 years, and that's the way I've always looked at it. I've been accumulating it every two weeks for over 30 years, never to, to get wealthy, just as a way to save wealth, hopefully that I never need to use. If I do, I'm darn glad I have it. If not, I pass it on to my kids. And I think that's the most important way to look at your gold and silver. Uh, and, and as we've been saying lately, a common theme, it's not about return on your money, it's about return of your money. And these days that may be more and more and more relevant than ever before. I wanna thank everyone for coming and, and in particular, uh, uh, David Smith, uh, Lobo, and, and Bill for uh, hopping on this time as, as first-time guests. We certainly appreciate it. You've added a lot to the discussion. And, of course, Chris and, and Dunnigan and um, uh, Kaiser and, and Elijah, thank you for uh, spending your evening uh, chatting with us. I, I hope to see you all real soon. You all take care of yourselves, and uh, happy holidays. Uh, very, very much appreciate your, your time and your, your, uh, your input. All right. Well, cheers, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and God bless. If you've decided that now is the right time for you to protect your family's financial future by acquiring physical precious metals, gold and silver, I'm delighted to let you know that I have now become a licensed dealer's representative for Miles Franklin, one of the oldest and most trusted names in bullion dealerships. And we can provide you with physical delivery to your personal possession or to professional fault storage or precious metals IRAs. Just email me at Liberty and Finance at ProtonMail.com and please include your name and phone number in your email to Liberty and Finance at ProtonMail.com. We'll get right back with you and find out how to best meet your needs so that you can either begin or increase your acquisition of physical precious metals now and protect your family's future starting today. To acquire gold and silver, just go to LibertyandFinance.com. When the main site comes up, click on Bullion Sales. That's LibertyandFinance.com bullion sales, you'll see my name, Dunnigan Kaiser, my phone number, and my associate, Kaiser Johnson, his phone number, our email, libertyandfinance at protonmail.com. Mm -hmm.